Hey there nation, welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with an episode of Meat for the Grinder. This is our mini campaign for our Nicaragua Dominion campaign for our Sector 7 Turf War, and this is Battle Report number 52. It is a sneak attack scenario that is fought between my two friends, Smell Like Febreze, as well as Odeth. Smells Like Febreze should be playing the Chain Breakers, our Slave Ogren's gang, while well, Odeth will be playing the People Eaters, our Helot Chaos Cult. So I'm going to play some background music real quick. If you want to see exactly what we're bringing for this scenario, go ahead and pause, take a look at your own leisure. So with that being said, let's get this battle report on a roll. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Alright, so the scenario rules for this one is sneak attack. Pretty much what ends up happening is that the attacker, which is played by the slave ogrens in this scenario, are trying to destroy the defending gang's gang relic. The defender starts up with five randomly selected sentries, and the sentry rules of course are applied to them. The defender sits up anywhere they want on the battlefield, and the attacker deploys within four inches of the battlefield edge and at least four at least four inches within another friendly fighter. Uh, the objective is to defile the gang's relic, is pretty much the goal is on this one. Uh, for the special rule for any defenders who are near the gang relic within six inches, they get plus two to their cool and leadership tests. And for the attackers, they have a special rule called defile the record uh, relic, which is a double action. If they're one within one inch of it, they defile it, and it no longer provides cool leadership bonuses. Plus, the fighter defiles the relic, also gets D3 experience points. Points. And at the end, start of every end phase, the defender earns D3 fighters, and they must deploy within one inch of any table edge, and now within 12 inches of an enemy fighter. Uh, pretty much the battle goes until the defender may either defiles the relic or the def uh, defender, uh, sorry, the attacker defiles the defender's uh, relic, or the attacker is driven off through bottle tests. For rewards, D6 times 10 credits the attacker for defiling the relic, and if not, D3 times 10 creds. And if the defender protects the relic, they earn D6 times 10 creds, and if not, they earn D3 times 10. For experience, one point of experience for each one who participates in the battle report. Also, plus one experience for any leaders if by the end of the game they have fighters left on the table. For reputation, if this is the very first time they're fighting against each other, they get plus one and got a reputation for that. Also, plus two reputation for the attacker and minus two the defender if the relic ends up being defiled. And of course, if any gang bottles out, they lose one point of reputation. So, with the uh, scenario rules over, let's go and talk about the battle plan real quick. So here's an overhead shot of the entirety of the battlefield. As you can see, my friends are playing in a Zone Mortalis battlefield. It is, uh, it's got three uh, tiles in the center with two tiles on either side. And as for the battle plan on this one, I'm not really sure what my friends are thinking about for their battle plan. The only thing I'm aware of, of course, is that they are, of course, going to try to uh, try to stop each other uh, from achieving each other's objective. I mean, that part is pretty much obvious. But as to why they deploy their characters the way they did or what their plan is overall, um, I couldn't tell you. I'm just the arbitrator in this campaign. So all I'm doing is just taking photos of uh, this battle is all I'm doing for the most part. And of course, reporting that the results are for the uh, battle report. So with the battle plan over with, let's go ahead and talk about deployment real quick. Alright, so first of all, we're going to talk about the people eaters. Over here in the top le bottom left-hand corner of the battlefield, we have two members. We have Bin Bag, that is a Helot cultist, who's armed with flak armor. He's got an auto gun, auto pistol, as well as incendiary charges. And right next to him is Nerf number two, who's another Helot cultist, armed with flak armor. He's got a grenade launcher's crack and frag grenades. He's also got the maul ability as well, and he's also suffering from twisted flesh mutation. And in the top center chamber, as you can see in the top there, we have the gang relic for the uh, people leaders. Also in this little chamber, we've got three other fighters. On the left hand side, that is Blood Razor. He's a cult witch. He's equipped with flak armor. He's got a two handed axe as well as an auto pistol. He's got the witch, inure to insanity uh, special rules. He's also got the dark shield, the scouring, as well as warp strength uh, psychic abilities as well. And right next to him, of course, is Nerf number one. That's his chaos familiar. It's got owned by Blood Razor special rule, as well as Omen of Fortune, Precognition, Psychic Manifestation, as well as Clamber 
special rules. And then finally right next to him on the far right hand side that has the Cult Disciple Rar. He's equipped with mesh armor with a heavy stepper with suspensors attached to it. He's got an outer pistol drop rig. He's got the Inured Insanity special rule as well as the Infiltrate and Enfeebled special rules attached to him as well. And finally, over here on the right hand side, we have Hoodie. He's another Helic Cultist. He's equipped with flak armor. He's got an outer gun, outer pistol, as well as incendiary charges. And that pretty much makes up the initial deployment for the People Eaters on this one. So, going across the entirety of the battlefield for the Chain Breakers, over in the top, next to the little air vent there on the top of the screen, we have two more uh, Slave Ogrins. Up in the front, that is Dark Blaster. He is a Lobo Slave. He's equipped with Furnace Plate. He's got a Storm Welder, Augmented Fist. He's got the Lobotomize, Limited Learning Capacity, Slow Witted, and Runaway Skills. And then right behind him is uh, Chemo113, I believe that's his name. That's a Slave Ogrin. He's got a Furnace Plate, as well as a Storm Welder. He's equipped with a Brute Cleaver. He's got the Loyal Runaway, Limited Learning Capacity, as well as Headbutt Special Rule attached to him. In the bottom left hand corner, my friend Smells Like Febreze has deployed two more of her ogre slaves. On the left hand side, that is Sean Yu. He is a slave ogre and he's got furnace plate. He's equipped with an arc welder as well as augmented fist. He's got blasting charges. He's also got the loyal runaway limited learning capacity and headbutt skill. And right next to him on the right hand side is Dig Dug. He is a lobo slave equipped with furnace plate. He's got a two handed hammer, a stim slug stash, frag grenades. He's also got the lobotomized limited learning capacity, slow witted, as well as runaway special rules too. And finally, on the bottom right hand corner, uh, my friend Smells Like Breeze has deployed her last three fighters. On the left hand side, that is Light Blaster, who is a Lobo Slave, equipped with Furnace Plate, Storm Welder, and Spud Jacker. He's got the Lobotomized, Limited Learning, Slow, Witted, as well as Runaway Special Rules. In the center is my friend Smells Like Breeze's leader, that is Taijin Khan. He's the Ogre and Overboss. He's got Furnace Place, a Last Cutter, Blasting Charges, Runaway, and Commanding Presence ability. And then right next on the right hand side, that is Burps O Blood, which is a Slave Ogre with Furnace Plate. He's got a Heavy Rock Saw. Stim Slug Stash, he's got the Loyal Runaway, Limited uh, Learning Capacity, Headbutt, as well as Suffering from Eye Injury from before in the campaign. And that pretty much makes it smells like for Breeze's deployment on this one. So with my friends deployment over with, we go directly to the top of turn number one, and my friends roll off for initiative to see which of them will be going first. Alright, so the very first turn goes to the Slave Ogrens. My friend Smells Like Febreze managed to get the initiative on this one, and for her very first activation, she activates the Light Blaster. So Light Blaster moves up his normal moon allowance, and then opens fire with his Arc Welder directly into Hoodie. And that poor guy got blasted right out of his socks on that one as well. And the reason why is because I think my friend Smells Like Febreze managed to fight, roll 5 hits on that. That's because an R a Storm Wielder actually gets 3 rapid fire dice, so that part was insane. Unfortunately for uh, my friend uh, Smells Like Febreze, Light Blaster had only a ballistic skill of 6. And so because that she had to roll a perfect 6 when I get that shot off, and she did, to make matters worse, because there's a shock ability on the Storm Wielder, if uh, a roll of 6 to hit automatically wounds, so all of those hit automatically wound on that part. So that part was absolutely insane insane put an out cold result though so um my friend uh oh death got really lucky on that part luckily for smells like Febreze, the alarm was not raised on that one so because that my friends decided to activate raw next he is randomly chosen for the uh, scenario for the uh, sentry rules and uh, my friend smells like Febreze won that one so he moves over to the left four inches away from the door to the right smells like Febreze then activates dig dug who does a dough move to the right hand side moving forward eight inches and once again, the sentry rule applies again. Uh, this time, I believe it was nerf number two who was selected next. So because of that, it smells like Febreze as well as Odeth will have to see who controls him. Unfortunately for my buddy Odeth, smells like Febreze won the initiative on that one. So because of that, uh, he moves up, I think, four or five inches forward, uh, heading down the hallways where he's going for the most part. Uh, because he has no control of himself. He's just a sentry at this point. For Smells Like Febreze's next activation, she then activates her our commander, Taijin Khan, the leader, as well as uh, Burps of Blood. Those two characters do double movements, moving up right next to Light Blaster, heading their way up to the vault there on the top of the screen, and they're just kind of standing right there right next to uh, Light Blaster. Now, if you're wondering why Light Blaster didn't go with them uh, during that activation, that's because uh, Light Blaster is a slave ogre and lo uh, lobo slave, which means he does not be able to do ad group activations because uh, he's been lobotomized, so I won't be able to help him out on that one. So from there we go back to the defenders in this one, and once again we roll up to see which uh, player can manage to control this sentry. Binbag is selected next, and once again, uh, my poor friend Odeth, he has no luck whatsoever. And so because of that, uh, Smells Like Febreze moves him up, I think, three inches forward is what he ends up doing. 
So with the bottom area free of guards, uh, smells like a reason activates Shan Yu, who does a basic moving forward over to that door there and opens up that little vault door right there in the center of the battlefield. Now, if you're wondering why that door was so important to go into that center room, it's because there is a vent. Uh, we just couldn't put the fin token on it because that wall is there, but there's a vent token that goes beneath that wall into the center chamber. So smells like a breeze can slip through there and go into that area if she wants to as well. And once again, sentries are chosen yet again. And once again, Odeth also fails his uh, sentry test. So because of that, um, the Blood Razor, as well as Nerf number one, because Nerf number one is his familiar, moves over to the right hand side, I think five inches away from uh, Shan Yu. So it smells like for reason activates Dark Blaster, who actually does a double movement out of the vent there on the top right hand corner of the uh, screen, making his way directly towards that left hand vault door, using that little piece of uh, sight blocking uh, material to uh, act as cover. And once again, Odeth failed his sentry test on this one, so Smells Like Febreze then takes nerf number two and moves him back another couple inches to the bottom left, so that way he can't look at the uh, Ogrins are coming up there on the top. And I have to admit, these Ogrins are moving pretty stealthily for big lumbering guys, and I think it's kind of, kind of interesting. And then finally, for Smells Like Febreze's final activation, she moves up Kimo 113, and he just does a double movement as well going through the vent, uh, because it takes double movement in order to do that, and it's right there outside the vent as well. So with the um, activations all over with, and since there's no need for an end phase, that pretty much takes the end of turn number one. So here's the end of turn number one, and here's an overhead shot of the entirety of the battlefield. As you can see, uh, Smells Like Febreze is slowly attacking from the top as well as the bottom of the uh, battlefield, heading directly to that top center uh, vault there on the top of the battlefield. At the same time, Shan Yu is also trying to infiltrate that little mini vault to get to the vault room as well. Luckily for Smells Like Febreze, none of her ogrens have been detected. She got really lucky with that Storm Builder shot going off without drawing any attention. At the same time, my poor buddy Odeth has been failing his uh, rolls for his uh, sentries, and Smells Like Febreze has been basically putting them over the place so that way we don't see our ogrens. So that being said, we go directly to the top of turn number two and both of my friends roll off for initiative to see which of them will be going first. So that takes us directly to the bottom, uh, top of turn number two, and the slave ogres get to go first yet again. My friend smells like Febreze gets priority. So she does a group activation with Taijin as well as Burps of Blood. Both of those characters do a double movement up to the vault door to the right hand side. Looks like she's getting ready to set a, uh, an assault right through to the main vault there on the right hand side of the vault room. And for uh, Odeth, he did manage to get the initiative on this one, so because of that, he does activate Roar. Uh, Roar actually managed to move far, I think, four inches to the right-hand side, so that way he's getting ready to aim that heavy step right through that door in case Tai Jin as well as uh, Burbs of Blood decided to come in through that way. So, Smells Like Febreze then activates Dark Light, uh, Dark Blaster. Dark Blaster does a no removal allowance for to open up that door, so the door pops open. He gets a beautiful shot right down the back of those three Chaos Cultists, and he opens up with his Storm Wielder directly into them. So he managed to get, I think, six shots off of them as well. Managed to put a serious injury as well as a flesh wound directly under Roar. So he goes smashing face down to the ground and also, you know, bleeding out right now because he's seriously injured. Luckily, uh, Blood Razor did pass his uh, cool check. Same thing with the little Chaos Familiar nerf number one as well. However, uh, what's his name? Gets hit. Um, what's his name? Blood, uh, Blood, Witch get, uh, Blood Razor gets hit, uh, but only gets pinned, but does suffer a flesh wound for that part as well. Now, the little real reason why we have the little misfire die there on the right-hand side is because it represents the fact that the alarm has been raised, because this shot was all kinds of powerful, so everybody heard it as well. Uh, the thing would end up happening, it was it would have been much more damaging for Smells Like Febreze, but what happens when you fire a Storm Roller, if you have multiple targets, what you do is you have to randomize where the shots go for all the targets in the forward arc. So what my friend uh, Smells Like Febreze decided to do is take a D6, uh, they rolled it different values one to two was for the chaos familiar three to four was for roar and five to six were for a uh, blood razor most of the shots went directly into uh nerf number one the familiar and the familiar has a three award save so because of that most of the shots didn't really didn't do much of anything however smells like febreze did roll an ammo check and she does have unstable rules for these things if they if they don't pass ammo check so she rolls her ammo check she fails it she rolls another d6 again and on a score of one through three if you fail that ammo check that fighter goes out of action with an injury and that's exactly what happened uh she rolled a two so because of that uh dark blaster he actually gets sent directly into out of action with a grievous injury so he'd be messing out his next battle report as well so my friend uh, Odeth decides to go next. He decides to activate Blood Razor. Blood Razor gets back on his feet again, escaping his pin with a simple action. Then he uses a basic action to activate the, uh, the Dark Shield in order to give himself plus one to his save, as well for himself as well as for his familiar as well. 
However, it was all for naught because uh, Smells Like Febreze then activates Chemo 113. He goes around the corner and once again opens up with his uh, Storm Welder directly into these three fighters as well. And once again, the shots were randomized this time. As you can see, all the shots went into uh, nerf number one as well as into Roar. Magic put an out of action result on Roar, putting him directly out cold, and also put a grievous injury on nerf number one as well. So because of that, there's another second kill, sorry, there's a third kill that the uh, the Slave Ogre into the Chain Breakers managed to bring as well. Once again, O-Death got really lucky because uh, Blood Razor did pass his uh, cool check, and that's absolutely amazing seeing these Storm Builders going off like that. So with that, we then go directly to the bottom of the screen here. My friend O-Death decides to activate two of his fighters because he has the Blessing of Slanesh. He activates Nerf number one as well as, uh, sorry, Nerf number two, I'm sorry, as well as Bin Bag. They both then move up in order to open fire directly into Dark Blaster. So nerf number two managed to go the shot off first, managed to hit, um, what's his name, managed to hit uh, um, Kimo 113, also managed to put two flesh wounds on, a uh, flesh wound on as well, so because that, he does go down real quick, he is currently pinned because he's only suffering a flesh wound, so it does drop his toughness by one, which does make him easier to wound, but at the same time though, he can still escape pin and still cause all kinds of problems as well. However, Bimbag decides to follow through because he activated both these fighters. So because of that, Bimbag follows through and throws a uh, incendiary charge directly at um, uh, Kimo 113. But unfortunately, though, he missed his shot, so it scatters over three inches to the left-hand side. But it doesn't matter, though, because that blast radius is a five-inch blast radius for all incendiary blasts. So because of that, that goes up like a, like a freaking candle. And he managed to put a second flesh wound directly onto Chemo 113 as well. The only problem though is that Chemo 113 is a slave ogre, so he does have toughness 5, so they have actually quite a bit to go before they can actually whittle him down to an easier number. So he's right now his toughness 3, so he's just as tough as the rest of his peers, but at the same time though, that also makes the very last activation for the uh, uh, people leaders on this one. So the rest of the turn is dedicated to my friend Smells Like Febreze, because that's the only one that has fighters left. So she does a double movement real quick, by activating Shan Yu. Shan Yu does go through the little vent there on the bottom of the wall and pops up the other side into the main vault room. At the same time, Light Blaster as well as Dig Dug, they start making their way directly to that same little mini vault room to follow Shan Yu, and they both do double movements as well. So with the action phase over, you go directly to the top of the end phase. And in the end phase, my friend O-Death has his reinforcements come in. He managed to get two reinforcements this time. Up in the front, that is the Nameless. He's a Chaos Spawn. He's got the Warp Monstrosity, Mindless Beast, as well as Out of Control spe uh, Special Rules. He's also Weapon Skill 3 up, Strength 5, Toughness 6, 3 Wounds, and 3 Initiative with 3 Attacks. So this is the most powerful of all the Chaos Spawn. And right behind him, of course, is Snarl the Cult Disciple. He's packing Mesh Armor. He's got a Heavy Stubber with Suspenser attached to it. He's got an Auto Pistol as well as a Drop Rig. He's got the Inured Insanity as well as the Infiltrate Special Rule as as well. So with that, that takes a look at the end of turn number two, and as you can see, things are not looking very good right now for the people eaters. Most of the defenders are currently down or out of action as well, and plus you can see here the slave ogres are starting to swarm the top vault on the top of the screen there in order to activate that gang relic and try to defile it as well. So with turn number two over with, we go directly to the top of turn number three, and my friends roll off for our priority to see which of them will be going first. So that takes directly to the top of turn number three, and the Chaos Hel 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 Cultist managed to get the priority on this one. So O-Death does a group activation. He activates his uh, Cult Disciple Snarl, also does a group activation of the Nameless One. The Nameless One does a dull movement, moving up, I think, seven or eight inches directly to the center of the battlefield, making his way towards the Ogrens. He then activates Snarl, and then opens up with his Heavy Stubber directly, I believe, into Burps of Blood. But unfortunately, though, he missed his shot, so because of that, nothing much happened there. So uh, that activation was kind of wasted, unfortunately. So Smells Like Febreze goes next and activates Sean Yu, and Sean Yu goes tearing across the vault room directly into Blood Razor, catching me in close combat as well. And unfortunately for O-Death, Blood Raiders are totally outmatched with this fight. Sean Yu's got Strength 5, he's also packing an Arc Welder, which gives you minus 3 AP. He's also got an Augmented Fist as well, so you know combat is pretty much in the advantage of uh, Sean Yu at this point. And just to illustrate that as well, as you can see there, we get an out cold result as well from the combat phase on that one. And the reason why is because the Arc Welder. The actual end ended up happening, he actually managed to put three flush wounds with the Arc Welder directly onto uh, Blood, uh, Blood Razor. So because that, he does automatically go out of action because he has no more toughness anymore. And that's why he gets the uh, out cold result at the same time as well. And of course, Smells Like Febreze decides to follow through with Sean Yu, who ends up actually one inch away from the Gang Relic. Luckily for my buddy O-Death, though, uh, he's, uh, Smells Like Febreze has nobody that can activate in order to defile, the rec uh, uh, defile the Relic at this point, so combat will be going for another round at least. So O-Death then decides to activate Nerf number 2. Nerf number 2 moves up his normal movement allowance and open up with his grenade launch with a crack grenade, but unfortunately for him, though, he missed his shot, so nothing much happened there. 
So Small Black for Bees then activates Light Bla Blaster next. Light Blaster turns 180, moves his normal Lunar Lounge directly towards the Nameless One, and cuts loose with that Storm Wilder of his. And she managed to get, I think, four shots of the beginning on that one, and she rolled a six in order to hit. So because of that, all those wounds wound automatically. So because of that, the Nameless One has no armor save. So he eats up his three wounds and puts him directly out of action with an out cold result as well. So that drops another uh, dead body uh, for the Slave Overns in this one. So then over here we go the next activation. My friend Odeth decides to activate uh, Binbag. Binbag once again tries to open fire with his uh, incendiary charges, but this time it scatters, I forgot, I think it's like way up to the top. I think it's scattered like 10 inches away. Not 10 inches, not 10 inches away, 6 inches away. So the blast goes off and does nothing. So because that goes back to Smells Like Fabrice's turn, she then activates uh, Kima Woman 3, gets back on his feet again, and he opens up again with his Storm Roller directly into the line of sight of these two fighters. And I think he managed to get six uh, six shots off of that one. He managed to put serious injuries on both of these guys. So because of that pin bag, as well, Nerd Number Two dropped down, face down to the ground, and they are currently bleeding out as well. So things are not looking very good at all for the people leaders at this point. So with that, we go directly to Smells Like Febreze. So Smells Like Febreze and activates Dig Dug. Dig Dug moves out his normal moon allowance directly towards the um, uh, Snarl, decides to throw a frag grenade directly at him. Unfortunately, though, he missed. And when he rolled to see where it scattered, scattered back, I think, one inch only. So because of the blast radius, still catches Snarl. The blast manages to put one wound on Snarl, but that's okay because Snarl has two wounds, but it also pushes him back an inch as well. So because he is currently pinned, he is about halfway dead as well. And for Smells Like Fabrice's final activation, she then activates uh, Tai Jin, who then manages to open the door, as well as him, as well as uh, uh, Burps of Blood move up directly towards the main vault, where the gang relic is located at. And that pretty much ends up turn number three. So with that, we go directly to the end phase, and once again, my friend O Death managed to get two more fighters onto the table as well. Leading the front is the Oculoid. He's got he's a Helot Cultist with Flak Armor. He's got an Auto Gun as well as Auto Pistol and Incendiary Charges. And also right next to him is King Slender, the Cult Demagogue. He's got the uh, Mesh Armor, Cult Icon, Shotgun with Solid and Scatter Shot. He's got a Sword as well as an Auto Pistol. He's got Devotion and Near to Insanity, special skill, oh, best special rules. He's also got the Commanding Presence and Iron Will. Um, sp um, skills as well and uh, that pretty much makes up his reinforcements on this one and unfortunately for my friend O death um what's his name um there for two he does manage to survive uh his, his uh, injury actually gets a flush wound so because they flips over it gets pinned and with a flush wound at the same time meanwhile bin bag though he is still seriously injured and he is still bleeding out as well so that takes directly the end of turn number three, and here's an overhead shot of the battlefield. As you can see, the Chaos Cultists are having one heck of a time trying to fight these Slave Ogrens. These Slave Ogrens are just kind of powering through them real fast with those Storm Wilders. Those things are absolutely terrifying to see exactly how well they work within the small confines of uh, the Zone Mortalis battlefield. At the same time, the Slave Ogrens are starting to put their assault on the main vault room in the top in order to defile that gang relic. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number four, and both of my friends roll off our priority to see which of them will be going first. So we go directly to the top of turn number four, and the Slave Ogrens get to go first. So because that smells like Fabrice decides to do a group activation with Taijin Khan, who then also activates Burps of Blood, as well as Shan Yu. And Shan Yu does a double action to defile the Gang Relic, and just like that, the Gang Relic is defiled and pretty much ends the battle report. So there you have it, you guys. This brings us directly to the end of the games with a victory for the Slave Ogrens. The Chainbreakers managed to destroy the relic of the People Eaters, and it also brings shame and ruin to the People Eaters and the Chaos Helicultus, but at the same time elevating the Slave Ogrens of the Chainbreakers to higher realms of accolades. So with the uh, battle report over with, we go directly to the post game because this battle report is now officially over. All right, so first of all, we start with the People Eaters, and the People Eaters had several injuries on this one. Roar got an out cold result, same thing with Blood Razor, as well as Hoodie, and Nerf number one suffered grievous injuries, so he'll be missing out his next game as well. Now, there is also a couple of extra injuries that took place on this one as well. Uh, the Nameless was the Chaos Spawn. He makes a full recovery. I forgot to mention that as well. Two more members of this gang also get injured as well. First of all, we have Sockethead. Sockethead suffered a memorable death, and the reason why is because three members of this gang had to rein in the Nameless Chaos Spawn, and unfortunately, well, well, one was rolled, so because of that, that uh, Saka had to roll up on the serious injury table to see exactly what happened to him. Rolled at 66. So just like that, the Nameless killed Socket Head, and Socket Head is killed, eaten by the Nameless Spawn as well. Now, that's the first death. The second death that took place was during the Dark Ritual. Uh, what ended up happening is that uh, the Oculoid was chosen as the embodiment of the sacrifice on this one. 
and unfortunately my buddy Odeth botched his rolls on this one so because of that he did not gain favor with Slanesh so apparently Slanesh frowned upon their performance this battle so because of that nothing happens there the Oculoid gets killed and he gets transformed into a chaos spawn his stats are four up for weapon skill strength four toughness five two wounds four up initiative with two attacks as well so he becomes another chaos spawn for this gang and the Oculoid of course is dead because he became a chaos spawn instead for advancements none of the members of this gang advance at this time from the territory they earn one point reputation from their settlement and they also recruit a brand new Calacaltus named Sockethead the second so this is Sockethead number two and they also earn 60 credits from that settlement as well and for their Promethean cash it still provides with three incendiary charges for their gang at the trading post they purchase flak armor auto pistol maul as well as frag grenades for Sockethead number two and as well because the uh, Ocula was chosen for the dark ritual he died and the gang lost favor with Slanesh but the gang also gets a brand new chaos spawn as well. For the reputation, they get one point of reputation from fighting against the chain breakers for the very first time, as well as one point of reputation from their territories. Unfortunately, though, they lost the scenario, so they lose two points because their gang relic got defiled, and it keeps them at their. Like, they basically break even with 23 points of reputation in total. The new gang record now is at four wins, as well as five losses, and the new gang right now is at 2,715 points. So with that, we go directly to the Chain Breakers, the victors of this battle. And of course, the for the injuries, Dark Blaster suffered a grievous injury because his uh, Storm Welder basically filled an ammo roll and it blew up in his hands pretty much. Uh, for advancement, Sean Yu as well as Light Blaster, both those characters leveled to level 2 and they both got plus 1 to their toughness. So now these guys are toughness 6 ogres, which is absolutely terrifying. From their territories, from their settlement, they earned 1 point reputation and managed to recruit a brand new Lobo Slave named Igor for free. So they recruited that guy. They also managed to raise up to 50 credits from their settlement as well. Now for the collapsed dome, they decided to roll 46 once again and also earned 160 credits. No doubles were rolled this time, so because of that, they net themselves 160 credits from that as well. And for their brand new territory, I forgot to put this in the picture, I do apologize, they managed to capture a workshop, and in that workshop they managed to recruit a new ammo jack for their gang named Mechboy. He's equipped with a combat shotgun with salvo and shredder ammo, he's also packing a power hammer, and he's also got mesh armor as well. Now, for the trading posts, in the end, they managed to get 210 credits from their territories, 60 credits from the scenario, and 20 credits from their stash, giving them a grand total of 290 credits. Well, the 290 credits, they hired two new slave ogrens named Draco 111 and Stavro 256. They equipped both those guys with furnace plates as, ax as well as axes. They then took the Storm Wielders from Light Blaster and Dark Blaster and gave it to them instead. So Draco 111 uh, and Stavro 256, they're both packing... Um, Storm welders, they also got uh, furnace plates as well as axes as well. Now, because of that, Light Blaster and Dark Blaster do not have guns anymore, so because of that, they purchased an additional Spud Jacket for Light Blaster, giving them two Spud Jackets for weapons, and they purchased an additional Augmented Fist for Dark Blaster, so that way he's wearing a pair of Augmented Fists as well. They then also purchased a two headed axe as well as furnace plates for their brand new level slave, Igor. For the reputation, they got one point of reputation for their settlement as well as three from the scenario, giving their grand total of 14 reputation. Their new record now is at two wins as well as one loss, and their new gang rating now is at 2,163 points. So that's good for this week, guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. You guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Instagram, Facebook, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's good for this week, guys. We'll catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.